There. <clears throat> My signal is on, and it's looking pretty good. <coughs> All right. Okay. Uh, is it uh, Ildar? Hi. Okay. It says 17 are watching. Yes, as soon as I started, half of them ran away. <laughs> oh, we're up to 18. Hi, Rick. Yeah. So is the audio coming through clean? Are the signals looking pretty good? I can make some adjustments. There we go. Hmm. Thanks for putting these on. Oh, my pleasure, Son. Um, so these programs are uh, kind of sponsored between myself uh, and the Alpine Club of Canada. I work um, in the winter as the lead guide for the ACC, and then I also work uh, privately as a guide. And uh, my spouse and I also have a completely separate business. We work in video and multimedia. That uh, basically helps pay the way so I can afford to be a guide. And what we have tonight is avalanche safety. All right. Okay, no questions yet? All right. Well, let's see. Um, Seattle, oh wow, great. <laughs> it's kind of freaky how the whole world can be watching you. Let's just uh, <clears throat> have a little fun here while we're waiting. So this is a video, no audio to it, so I'll just keep talking. That was sent to me. <clears throat> this is the bulletin for that location. It occurred just outside of Whistler on the Coast Mountains. And the avalanche hazard was moderate low and low, and it says flurries will accumulate through the day. Their concerns were just over the ridge tops and lee slopes, which is exactly what they were skiing. And so uh, that rider was able to escape. And the first time I watched this movie, I thought, wow, that was a pretty close call. And it wasn't until about the third time I watched it, and my spouse had to point this out to me still, that there was more going on than just this. So watch closely. They trigger the slide, and the lower rider manages to hang on and escapes. However, there is a different person from a different group um, just following the uptrack. They were alone, they had no avalanche gear, and they took the brunt of, uh, of that avalanche. Fortunately, the individual who filmed this did pick up on the person down below, and they went in to assist. The, uh, the person was not hurt, um, but they did have to be dug out, and they had no equipment, no transceiver, probe, or shovel. This is just moving immediately across to another shot with my family. So I'm just going to back off that. Okay. That just leads into the next story. All right. So we're about five minutes in. And uh, it's my pleasure, guys. So we're up to 36. Slowly creeping up. Yeah. So do you guys have any questions? Has anybody been out skiing yet? What are you seeing? I've been out uh, for the last three weekends. And uh, <clears throat> what I'm seeing in the snowpack is it's pretty early season. The good thing about the Rockies this year is we had um, some warm temperatures early with a pretty good snowfall. And that settled up. And we've actually got kind of a base that's making it a little hotter to uh, get your skis stuck in the, the trees and the rocks than usual. The downside is we also have two crusts in that snowpack and they're just beginning to break down and that's going to create a weak layer that's probably going to haunt us for a long time. There's been some really powerful winds in K country that have completely redistributed the snow. And so those areas that are sheltered and there's fairly deep snow 
are probably wind slabs, which basically means they need some, some time to settle down and strengthen up. Wind slabs tend to be a short-term problem, but they're sitting on these crusts, which are getting weaker and weaker. So as we get more storms and we get more loading from wind and snow, we can probably expect to see some, some avalanches on those crusts. And as I said, that's called a persistent weak layer. And so we're looking at a situation where, you know what, <clears throat> for the next month or two at least, we need to be careful because that's going to be haunting us. So for the Rockies, that's not too different. Most years, it's usually March before the snowpack is deep enough and strong enough that we start stepping out on it. And even then, sometimes it's still kind of spooky. And maybe once every four or five years, we get a more stable snowpack and we can do some bigger stuff. But there's a reason they don't film big ski movies out here. We don't have the snow and we often don't have the stability. So that's what the coast is for. <clears throat> All right, so we're getting close. No questions. Nobody has a question about the snowpack or general avalanche safety while we get ready to go? Okay. So just keep in mind, this is a really brief introduction, but it's a starting point. And um, I believe I've got my email um, on this page. It's hard to see with the dark background here, but once I move on, you'll see it. If you have any questions after the show, you're welcome to send me an email, and uh, I will get back to you within a day or two. And also, I have uh, our website, because what I'm showing you is basically an, an ebook that uh, my spouse and I built um, for Avalanche Safety. So it's the, the world's first interactive multimedia ebook for Avalanche Safety. It runs on a desktop or laptop computer, and it's been really useful for teaching Avalanche courses. I've taught uh, two so far this winter, and I've got two coming up in the next five days. So that'll keep me busy. Any incidents that have happened so... happened so for near you? We had an incident just a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> Just after we had our first good snowfall and early into November, people were really hungry to get out skiing, even though our snowpack was still really thin. And so uh, there was a group that had skied the uh, Haig Robertson Traverse, which is a, a classic line that I've never skied yet. I'm gonna try and take my family this winter and do it if the conditions permit. But they made the traverse and good on them for doing that. But on the descent, going down the creek, um, one of the skiers lost control and because the snowpack was so shallow, as he went uh, ricocheting down the creek bed that you normally ski, um, he wasn't hitting the snow, he was hitting rocks and unfortunately he died of trauma. So that's the thing you gotta watch early season. And something I found that I'm really cautious about now that I'm getting old but I still have both my knees intact, is if you wanna ski a long season, don't start in November. Just wait till things get a little deeper and a little more stable and, you know, the hazards are a bit better buried and start skiing by sometime in December when the snowpack is actually something there. But don't stop skiing. There's really good skiing into April. In fact, right through to the end of April is a great time to go skiing. Some of the higher mountain trips, some of the big traverses, they are great April tours because you have nice long days. You have lots of sunshine and the temperatures are warm. So it's actually kind of fun. And then you can keep skiing. Some of the best powder skiing I've ever had was in the middle of May. But I went above 3,000 meters. Actually, it was over 11,000 feet. It's still winter up there, but they've got beautiful long days, nice temperatures, and the skiing is great. So you got to figure out where, but there is really good skiing that extends well beyond when everybody else is, you know, getting out for hikes to see the wildflowers or riding their bikes. There is a really good extended season in the spring. But for some reason, people don't take advantage of that. And the avalanche hazard is either pretty low or pretty easy to get a handle on because it's usually daytime heating. So make the most of that. This is what I like to do. If I'm having a good year and I want to keep skiing, I ski well into May. But I always play it cautious these years now. November and early December, things are thin. It's easy to trigger an avalanche and it's easy to hit things down below. And frankly, you know, whether I get caught in a slide and get hurt or whether I bounce off some rocks and get hurt, it really kind of minimizes your winter, and it wasn't that good to begin with. All right. And uh, thanks, Max. You can just call me Doug. Okay, so that's sort of it for incidents. We are at 7.30. 
So what do you say we get started? I always have a nice intro for this course. Okay, so that's always a good intro. That avalanche I filmed just 100 meters from my house. They do uh, avalanche control work um, because the road underneath uh, is exposed to that feature. So whenever we hear the helicopter flying, we run out to see what's, what's happening. Now, technically speaking, an avalanche can be many things. It can be a mass of rock, snow, ice, or just about any kind of debris flowing down rapidly on a steep slope. However, for the purpose of this, when we talk about avalanches, it's strictly snow. And the reason for that is snow behaves differently from all these other materials. And so, in order to understand the conditions in which you may or may not have an avalanche, you have to be thinking snow because the other ones require different mechanisms. Okay? So, these are strictly snow avalanches when I talk about avalanches at this point. All right. So let's take a look. This is a video I was given permission to use. And it's pretty interesting. So as you watch him ski down, just when went over that steep roll, that's where he turned to the side. And roll transitions or convex rolls, bulges classic trigger points. Hmm. There we go. And now he's buried. This is all in real time. I've done nothing to modify this footage other than superimpose data on it. And this is straight from his helmet cam. He's not actually fully buried. Both of his hands are sticking out of the snow. And yet he cannot escape. He can't do anything to dig himself out. And the reason for that is if you watch closely at the beginning, he put his ski pole straps on and his poles are buried. So his ski poles have effectively handcuffed him into the snowpack. And that is why he can't move. Never wear your ski pole straps because they are a hazard. Now, this black line represents survival time in Switzerland. Um, we didn't have data for the longest time in Canada, so we assumed that Switzerland and Canada were pretty similar, and we used their data, partly because Canada has a very long history of working with uh, Swiss avalanche researchers and Swiss guides, so it was a natural fit. But when we did run the numbers um, in the early 2000s, this is what we found. It was very, very different. And so in Canada, um, burial time is far more crucial. If you want to have a 50-50 chance of surviving a uh, full burial in Canada, the party you're with has to dig you out within 12 minutes, and you've got a 50% chance, chance of survival. Whereas in Switzerland, you've got almost half an hour. So it's quite a difference. And people sometimes wonder why, which is a really valid question. And the answer is because of the snow. That red line is actually the average. If you're buried in the coast and um, you've suffered an avalanche in, the, in Whistlers or somewhere up along in uh, northwestern BC, survival time beyond 20 minutes is almost zero for a full burial because the snow is so heavy and dense. In the Rockies, survival time beyond 30 minutes is also almost zero. Not because the snow is so dense, but because if the party hasn't been able to dig you up by then, there's something else going on. Our snow isn't as deep. The best uh, extended curve for survival was what we call the transitional zone, which is that area sort of between Golden and Revelstoke. 
was it west of Revelstoke, but sort of that area, the Columbia Mountains. And in there you have a snowpack that's kind of a balance between the cold, dry snowpack of the Rockies and the heavy, dense, wet snowpack of the coast. That's also where we tend to find the best skiing. If you're out backcountry skiing, plenty of friends have probably taken you to uh, Rogers Pass, or you've gone there yourself, and it's a pretty amazing place to go play. Um, that's the transitional snowpack. So different snowpacks have different survival rates. Now, the good news is the actual survival time, or the actual survival numbers in Canada are about the same as Switzerland. And the only way that's possible is if we're getting people out of the snow faster. And as it turns out, Canadians are among the world's fastest diggers. Because in Switzerland, they call for a rescue. They're nearby. In Canada, we use companion rescue. We do it ourselves for the simple reason there isn't time. Canada is just too big a country and too small a population in Western Canada for there to be rescue resources nearby. So we have to train and we have to be able to do that on the fly on our own. So anytime you go into avalanche terrain, you go in with the attitude that you and your friends have to save yourselves and get yourselves out. Because by the time the rescuers arrive, you're on the wrong side of that curve for a live recovery. Now this guy's lucky. It's only been three minutes and 40 seconds, and you can start to see the colors change. They're digging them out. And the reason they found him so fast, you'll see this when the, uh, the snow was lifted off his face, his hands were sticking out of the snow. But watch him, he won't be able to move because he's literally handcuffed by his ski boots. Now beyond um, avalanches, you should never wear your ski poles in the backcountry for the simple reason that if you catch them on anything, if they catch a tree, if they're caught in a rock, or even a dense layer in the snow, if you're moving at a relatively fast speed downhill, you're going to be caught and it's going to dislocate your shoulder. So just lose the poles. Do not wear your ski poles in the backcountry or your ski pole straps. You can have them on your skis, I do, but I never put them on. Just as simple as that. And when our son was little, I made it very clear to him I want him to never wear his ski pole straps, which was good until he took up cross-country skiing and then biathlon because it's like, put on your ski straps. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not allowed to. So it, it took a few months, but he finally realized at the, ski, at the Nordic ski area, he was allowed to wear his ski pole straps. But in the backcountry, don't. Lose your poles. That's why I buy cheap poles. So when I break them or I lose them, I don't care. I still have my shoulder intact. Um, yeah, so let's move on. Oh, but before we do, remember this. Ra an avalanche is not a random act, and it is not bad luck. Okay? Avalanches require specific ingredients to occur. There's no way around that. If you're going to have an avalanche, you need four critical ingredients. And uh, let me show you them right now. Oh, and yes, Jessica, he was fine at the end. Um, he was okay. But it's about the longest four minutes you can imagine, isn't it? So, my best advice for being an avalanche train is don't get caught in an avalanche. <laughs> Trust me, this is the way to go. So the first thing you got to have for an avalanche is you got to have snow. And I know that sounds blatantly obvious, but this is actually one of the tools you can use traveling in the backcountry, is if you move through the landscape and you're worried about avalanches, go to places where there's little or no snow. And that can be due to um, pronounced winds or the snow hasn't fallen much this year. Um, and those can actually be really good refuges. Ridges tend to be well windblown. Windward slopes have very little or no snow on them. And they don't make for great ski, to great ski tours, but they can make for relatively safe lines of ascent. And that way, you're not exposed when you're spending most of your time on the mountains going up. So look for areas with little or no snow, because that's your first ingredient. If you can deal with that, you're in pretty good shape. How deep is enough snow before you need to start thinking whether or not this is a potential avalanche feature? A good rule of thumb, I mean, there's depends on which book you read. They tend to talk 30 or 40 centimeters. If you're wearing alpine touring gear and you've got uh, ski boots on, to about the top of your boot. You know, if it's a little bit above the height of your boot, then yeah, there's enough snow there that if something was going to pop that deep or deeper, that, once it starts to accumulate, can have enough mass to begin to push you around and knock you over. That doesn't mean it's enough to bury you or kill you, but if it can knock you over, then if you're in a vulnerable position, say you're a climber or you're skiing along the edge of a crevasse, those are the kinds of things that might knock you into something that's going to make a bad situation worse. So 
as a good rule of thumb, you know, once it's above your boot top, it should start clicking on your brain that, ah, this might be avalanche country. Okay, your second ingredient is slope. And this is actually really important. This is one of our most important tools that we can work with to avoid exposing ourselves to avalanche terrain because nobody on the plains of Saskatchewan or Manitoba has ever had to deal with an avalanche unless they were in a river valley or it was the roof off their barn that, uh, that slid. So that can be a really effective tool as well. Watch your slopes. Okay, so these slopes are just pushing 30 degrees. You know, you look at them and you think, oh, I'd like to ski that. Well, of course you would. It's an avalanche slope. Okay, so that slope, I measured it. It's about 22 degrees, but it's fun. As soon as you get to 25 to 30, there's a low probability, but it's possible for avalanches. 30 degrees and up is avalanche terrain. 35 to 40 is the prime slope for an avalanche. Um, 40 to 45 is not as likely, but possible and 45 to 50 is in the low range. So there's actually a fairly defined range for avalanches and it's not always what we think. To give you an idea um, what that means is there's a lot of lower angle terrain we can use and if you're a climber there's a lot of steeper terrain you can use. But the zone that's most likely to slide are the zones we most want to go skiing on. So if you're a skier, and I have no idea how to get this Facebook post off, If you're a skier, a snowboarder, or a sledder, and you're looking at this terrain and you're thinking, oh, I like this, you're probably in the orange or red zone. If you ski powder, it's really hard to ski powder any higher than your boot top, unless the terrain is 30 degrees or steeper. And if it's just your dream powder day, you're probably skiing 35 to 40 degree slopes, because otherwise you're pretty much just going straight down the hill and you don't have enough speed to turn because snow produces a lot of friction. So be careful. Basically, when I'm in the backcountry and I look at a slope and I think, yeah, okay, it's a fine, but it doesn't look amazing, then I'm probably <coughs> below 30. If I'm looking at that slope and I'm thinking, oh, where have you been all my life? That is an avalanche slope, okay? I'm somewhere in that 30 to 45 degree terrain. And unfortunately, um, that's just the reality of it. So if you're looking at open slopes and you've got 35 to 40 degree terrain, you should be careful. Okay? Or sorry, 30 to 45 degrees based on statistics from 2006 to, oh sorry, 1996 to 2007. 90% of all avalanche fatalities in Canada occurred between 30 to 45 degree slopes. So those are the angles you really got to watch. Under unusual conditions, you can get a little more either way. But you know what? Nine times out of ten, it's right in that zone. And the vast majority is 35 to 40. Okay, that's, that's probably half of all avalanche fatalities. So, you got to have snow. you got to have slope. But the slope also can have a shape to it. Now, you can see right here, we've got planar, convex, and concave slopes. So a planar slope is straight. And basically, yeah, the snow up here is under tension from the weight of the snow underneath. A concave slope, basically the snow is pushing into itself and it tends to compress, which may be giving it a bit more strength. And then you have a convex roll. And when you have a steep roll like this, what you're dealing with is a slope that is under tension and getting steeper. These are the single most likely features to trigger an avalanche. So if you see a big steep roll and you jump on it just on the downhill side, that's when it's most likely to fail. Um, a good rule of thumb is if you're looking down the slope and you can't see the bottom, remember that skier at the beginning in the first video? We couldn't see the bottom. It wasn't until he could see the bottom of the slope, that's when he triggered the avalanche. So if you're going down a slope and you're sort of inching your way looking to see if it's safe, the second you cross that line that you can see the bottom, you're standing on the sweet spot. So be careful with convex rolls. All those slopes can slide, but a convex roll is the most likely. Okay, so how can you measure the slope? Okay, so I am going to be right back because I'll show you how you can measure a slope.
I just had to grab this. There we are. I just had to grab this device out of the other room. This is a slope meter and it costs 20 bucks and there's all sorts of variations of them. They all cost about 20 bucks and you literally just put it on the slope and it'll tell you the angle. Now you don't want to be standing on the slope if you're not sure about it. So you can also stand at a distance and sort of uh, gauge it, eyeball it if you have a profile. There's another really useful tool for seeing slope angles and let me see where I can find that. Um, that is a map but it's not quite the way you were thinking. Determining slope. Okay, don't bother this. This is the math. <laughs> if you actually have a slope. If you go to Google Earth, you can get uh, basically information and you can draw points on Google Earth and it will s draw out and calculate the slope angle for you. And it's not too far off. Another thing you can do is you can go, and this is called CalTOPO. Do a search for CalTOPO maps. Load them up and then go through the various filters or layers they have and one of them actually color codes the slope angles. So here we are. This is with CalTOPO maps and this is a peak um, that I ski up fairly regularly, Mount Field. And you can see the colors on the, uh, the slopes. And up here they match with 30 to 31, 32 to 34, 35 to 45. And you can see the range up here. I was a bit suspicious that something that covered most of North America would be fairly accurate. But I know Mount Field and I went up Mount Field and I actually measured slope angles relative to the elevations on the contours and it was in the ballpark. It's not exact, but it was a really good reference to give me a sense of what I was getting into. So I was surprised. It was better than I thought. It's not perfect, but it's good. And then I uh, had to go and guide a peak called Mount Columbia, which is in the back of the Columbia ice fields. And it's the highest peak in Alberta. And I hadn't been up there for 20 years or more. And so I pulled up the map, I looked at the slope angles, I printed it out, and I took it with me. And I was a bit suspicious, because I don't remember Mount Columbia being very steep, and yet it said it was just over 50 degrees near the top. And so as I was climbing the peak um, with my clients, I was checking the slope angle as I went up, and you know what? It was pretty close. So Keltop was actually a pretty good resource. Google Earth is actually a really good resource. You can use those to get basic information before you head out, or, um, you know, or in addition to that, carry a slope meter. And I actually do carry this with me all the time in the backcountry because slope meters are a really good way to know what your slope angles are. It's tough to know otherwise because we tend to see what we want to, not what's actually there. All right. So that's how you can check the slope angle. Or if you want, you can also just go online and you can download a slope uh, app for your phone. I don't do that because, you know, my phone's fairly expensive, it runs on batteries, and it's electronic. So the last thing I want to do is stick it in the wet snow. Also, it means i got to carry my phone with me, and I can't use it in the backcountry because we don't have reception. So a little slope meter works really well. You'll also find some slope meters and some compasses, and some of you may not even know what a compass is anymore. It's all GPS, but um, a compass can also carry a slope meter. Okay. Hmm, it's in the slide. Okay, what would it take for this now five layers to consolidate? Uh, if you're asking about the K-Country snowpack, it's going to take time. But let's go back to our ingredients. If you're going to have an avalanche, you've got to have snow, you've got to have a slope, and then the third thing you need is what we were just talking about is a weak layer. There's lots of different types of weak layers out there. And just as an example, because I live, I live on the edge of Kananaskis, I'm in Canmore, um, I do track that snowpack fairly carefully. And this is a layer in the snow. We like to think of snow as just being white. It's not. It's actually an amazingly complex material. And so what I did one night is I dug out uh, just a thin sheet of snow, put a light bulb in behind, and then waited for it to get dark and then uh, I photographed it being backlit. So you can see all these layers in here, and as avalanche technicians and forecasters, we do try to track the layers. But when I'm in the field working as a guide, I really don't care. All I care about are three things. Do I have a weak layer? Can I trigger it? And what are the consequences if I do? So 
When you read the bulletin and you go through that information, you're looking to get information on weak layers. When I'm moving through the field, I'm looking for clues on weak layers. But I don't really care what that weak layer is. If it's deep enough that it can break with any kind of depth and cause me problems, and if it's sensitive enough that a human can trigger it, that's a concern, and that's all I need to focus on. Right now, um, I was just talking, there's a, a wind slab, which is a potential weak layer. Those tend to settle out pretty quickly, so in two weeks, I won't be worried about those. But the crusts are going to create a persistent weak layer, which is this one here. And that's going to haunt us for weeks, possibly months. And as the snowpack gets deeper, they're going to be well buried and become deep persistent weak layers. And a deep persistent slab or a deep persistent weak layer can also haunt for a very long time. So I can't tell you what's going to happen because I don't know this, what's going to happen over the snowfall over the next three or four months. But I do know that's a problem and I got to watch it. Okay. So let's do a quick look. So here the snow is falling. And there's lots of different types of weak layers. This is a persistent deep way, weak layer caused by cold temperatures in a shallow snowpack. This is a very thin one, either caused by frost or a cold stretch, which caused faceting on the surface of the snow. This is a weak layer because it's new storm snow that hasn't had time to settle, bond, and stick to the old snowpack. The way I like to think of snow is I like to think of them as glass. Each new layer of snow is a sheet of glass. And if this glass settles and gets stiffer, then basically you've got a fairly strong piece of glass. But unless it bonds to the layer below it, you've got a problem. And what I mean by that is think of your car. Your front windshield is made of glass, and yet when you get a rock in the windshield, it doesn't shatter and just fall on your lap, because it should. That's because it's safety glass. It's a sheet of glass followed by a thin layer of plastic and a sheet of glass and a thin layer of plastic and a final sheet of glass. It's all heated together so the plastic actually glues or bonds the glass together. And that's exactly what's happening in the snow. Each layer of snow as it settles becomes a stiff, brittle layer of snow. But if it bonds to the layer below of it, it's turning into safety glass. And as long as each layer bonds to the one below it, life is good. But if any one of those layers fails to bond, now we've got this growing sheet of glass that just keeps getting bigger and thicker. And at some point, the weight may exceed the strength or come very close. And then you basically become the pebble on the windshield. Only this isn't safety glass and it shatters. That's basically what we're looking at. You've got to have a weak layer. You gotta have snow, you gotta have slope, you gotta have a weak layer, and then finally you gotta have a little hammer, which is what we call us, triggers. Anybody know what the leading cause of death is for mountain goats? It's avalanches. <laughs> they really should be taking this course, but the grizzly bears are blocking them because mountain goats make a very important food source for them in the spring when the sows with their cubs go looking around for some frozen goat melting out of the avalanche slope. It's an important food source, so they've been blocking us. But anything that adds weight to this loaded snowpack is a trigger. People are triggers, um, snowstorms are triggers. Add more snow, you're adding weight. Wind is a trigger, not the wind itself, but it moves snow. And so it scours the snow from one side of the mountain and drops it on the other. As it adds weight on the other side, that is a potential trigger. Um, so anything that adds weight. They can be rocks, they can be people, they can be animals, they can be sleds. The other thing that can trigger an avalanche is anything that will reduce the strength of the snowpack. Because think of that upper snowpack, if it's sitting on a weak layer, like a bridge. And if that bridge can hold a hundred cars on it, a trigger is that 101st car, and it literally breaks. But it took a hundred cars to get there. Now imagine if we have a condition in which the bridge itself gets weaker. The bridge is designed to hold a hundred cars but you've only got 90 on there. You're okay. However, some clown on a unicycle rides out to the middle of the bridge, gets off his unicycle, and has a blowtorch. And he literally starts cutting the bracing on that bridge so it keeps getting weaker. The first bracing he cuts, boom, it'll only hold 95. And you got 90 on the car, on the bridge. You're okay. Cuts the next one, boom, you're at 90. It's right on the threshold. And so as that clown starts cutting the third brace, boom, it fails because the bridge got weaker. And when it gets hot and the snow begins to melt, the bonds in the snow begin to break down and you lose strength. So that's heat. 
Temperatures above zero can melt the snow and trigger an avalanche, so the sun is a powerful force. The double whammy, the thing that will both add weight and reduce strength, is rain. So if you're ever out in the backcountry and it starts raining on you, not only are you having a miserable experience, but the avalanche hazard is going through the roof. The snowpack's getting weaker and it's getting heavier, and that's a really good time to make a run for it. Okay. And that produces avalanches. So the first type of avalanche is a loose snow avalanche. I'm not going to get into that too much because it's a little different, and generally they aren't that severe. They, they do kill people, but this is the one that really demonstrates the power of an avalanche. So you have a slope, you have snow, you have a slope, you have a weak layer, and they use an explosive as a trigger, and look at that. Like a sheet of glass, it just shattered across the face, and it's ripping down the mountain. Okay, that's pretty impressive. All right. So this was a controlled event. They were actually just getting rid of some explosives because they've been doing some work on a new safety system. But uh, they had a very good avalanche released from that one. So that's a slab avalanche. And that's what we're trying to avoid getting caught in. And yeah, everyone was fine, but they did get dusted. So how do you avoid this? Okay. One of the best tools we have in the backcountry is to look at the avalanche bulletin. And I'm going to let uh, Ilya Storm, who is a professional forecaster for Avalanche the Canada, The product for, for Avalanche Canada in many ways is the public avalanche forecast. It gets issued daily, and it's really challenging in some ways because we're trying to do many different things. We're trying to, we're trying to provide a product that serves all kinds of people. Um, and that is both people who have minimum avalanche training all the way to people who have professional level skills and experience and knowledge. We're trying to provide something that will help everybody who's going out in the mountains. And the way we do that is we break the forecast into two pages. Page one, there's dates, date that it was issued, and the expiry date. It's really important to make sure that you always have the latest information. Below that, we have a headline, and the headline is, is, is a way to really help you focus on what I, as a forecaster, think is the most important thing. Below the headline, we have, um, we have our danger ratings, um, which is a, a, a sort of a one-word summary of, of the hazard that's out there. And we do that for three elevation bands, the alpine, the tree line, and below tree line. And then we also provide a confidence statement. Um, avalanche forecasts are built on weather forecasts, um, and there's uncertainty. Sometimes we get it wrong. So we, we try to tell you what our confidence is and why. Um, sometimes it's because of, of the forecast that it just doesn't have a lot of data. We're a little data sparse. Um, sometimes it's because there's a lot of uncertainty about the timing or the track or, or the intensity of the weather. So we try to help you with, by revealing what our confidence is in our forecast. I think avalanche problems are, are a really powerful part of the forecast because in just a short word or two, persistent weak layer, persistent slab, wind slab, storm slab, those words are shorthand for a very rich concept. Uh, we provide information for what elevation band we think that, the, that this is a problem. We identify the likelihood of, of an occurrence, the likelihood of triggering an avalanche, um, as well as the size. Um, so it becomes, it's more information than a simple danger rating, but by giving you more and more detailed information, it, it empowers people to make better decisions. Uh, we start, we're able to start steering people to, uh, to take specific steps to help manage that risk, to help manage that problem. So that's all, that's, that's the information that's on the front page. If you go to the second page, the forecast details page, you'll find three sections. The weather forecast, a summary of what we, you know, the best forecast for that region. 
The second section there is a snowpack description. Uh, that's where we sort of dissect the snowpack, uh, talk about layers, talk about the architecture of the snowpack, which for people with more training, more knowledge, more experience, it gives them more detailed information to better understand and assess the likely conditions that they're going to find in the field. And possibly the most important part of the forecast is the avalanche occurrence section. That's where we can really add value because if we go back to, to the professional exchange of information, we're able to get to build a picture of where avalanches are running, what kind of avalanches. My friend Jill Fredston always says that avalanches are like fish. They swim in schools. So where we get, when we can start identifying patterns of elevation, aspect, size, how far they're running, you know, what's triggering them, um, we can impart that, we can, we can communicate that, and that it, past avalanches are one of the best ways to predict future avalanches. All this information is really, really seeking to do to do probably one thing, and that is to help you match terrain to the conditions. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's Ilya Storm. He's in charge of the uh, Avalanche Forecasts with Avalanche Canada. He's the director. And literally, just go to avalanche.ca, pulling it up now, and there it is, real-time data. You can go down, you can zoom in, Things are looking a little better in K country now. The hazards moderate, moderate and low. Click on, and you actually get the bulletin. So the one web address you need to know is avalanche.ca. That'll get you the bulletin for the different regions. Okay. So I'm just going to flip through the bulletins. Oh, there is one thing I should point out. I'll wait till we get there. So the bulletin is set for three zones, alpine, treeline, and below treeline. So each one's a bit of a different world. The alpine tends to have the most snow and the most exposure to wind and sun. Treeline is actually a fairly narrow transitional zone, and it's basically where there's enough trees that you start to see them, but they're open enough that you ski through them without any fear. And below treeline, Basically, unless you're an incredibly good skier, you must turn or face severe trauma. That's how I define treeline. If I'm scared of hitting something, I'm probably below treeline. If uh, I'm skiing through the trees and this is pretty smooth, then it's a treeline kind of feature. It's much more open. It's potentially more vulnerable. So, when in doubt, drop below treeline, get in the healthy timber, make sure there's nothing big over your head, and you're in a much safer place than if you start working your way up into the alpine where you've got more snow, more wind, and no anchors. And that's just a quick reference. Now, there's something called a special public avalanche warning, a SPA. If you ever see that, you need to be scared. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to put the avalanche hazard into a box. And the box has five references to it. And if it doesn't quite fit into any one of these boxes, we have to force it into whichever one it's closest to. And sometimes we're putting the hazard into the moderate box or the considerable box, but in fact, we're still scared. We think it's moderate, but it's got a lot of the properties of considerable. Or it's considerable hazard, but it hasn't quite crossed the threshold for our concern for high hazard. So the way we get the message out that things are not necessarily quite the way we believe they are, or they may be perceived, is the special public avalanche warning. And when you hear that, you need to pull back because the professionals are scared. And when you see that, there's two ways you can address it. One is you can be really extra cautious, read the bulletin, read the information, and try to manage it. But I find that unless I've been in the area quite a bit and I'm familiar with the snowpack, if there's a spa, my default position is to simply take it to one level higher. So if it's considerable and they're issuing a spa, I treat it like it's high. And that way I don't have to be figuring out the complexity of the situation. By treating it as it's high, I stay out of avalanche train completely. And so I can still get out, I can still enjoy myself, but I've just eliminated the concern. Because the whole system, let's see, 
um, works pretty well, but it's not always exactly to fit in these boxes. As you build your skills and experience, you'll start to realize when the hazard is low or moderate, you've actually got quite a bit of latitude. And you've got to be careful because in moderate there is a problem. But if you can understand that and address it, there's a lot of places you can go safely. When the hazard is high or extreme, you're into an avalanche cycle and you know to step back and be careful. Avoid avalanche terrain. When we say the hazard is extreme, we're not kidding around. We only use that rating maybe once every two or three years. So it's very rarely used. When we do use it, we're into a big avalanche cycle. A major storm has come. We've got all the problems lining up and we're pretty much certain there's going to be a lot of, a lot of activity. And it could even be off our historical charts. So when ex hazard's extreme, don't play games, pull back. Stay in the ski hill, stay in bounds, stay in gentle low angle terrain. Don't expose yourself to any kind of avalanche features or hazards, because that's when things could really go sideways. When the hazard is high, very similar, um, you've got to stay out of avalanche terrain. But if you're in places that are historically safe and you've got good information to support that, it's low angled, heavy timber, nothing big over your head, you're not exposed to any runouts on the avalanche paths, then that might be reasonable to get out and play in. The real problem though, because these are obvious, you've got a problem you've got to hide. And these have, have got some margins, so you can make a mistake or, you know, you've got some latitude. There are concerns, but you've got some room there. Considerable is the most, uh, is the riskiest of all the danger ratings. It's not the most dangerous, it's the most uncertain. Um, and because of that, it's very hard to say if the slope is safe or it's dangerous. And I can't do it. Um, certainly not on a regular basis. I'm often struggling with considerable. And it's very easy to ski a slope with considerable hazard and nothing happens. And it may happen often. But eventually it will go sideways on you. And this is why considerable hazard has seen more avalanche fatalities in 1996 to 2007 in Canada. More people have died in considerable hazard than all of the other danger ratings combined. Not because it's the most dangerous, but because it's the most difficult to figure out. So when the hazard is considerable, be very cautious. And of all the danger ratings, this is the one I have the most trouble managing because I'm never quite sure where the boundaries are. When in doubt, default to a bit more conservative terrain. And if you did something and nothing happened in considerable hazard, don't assume that means you know what you're doing. Because more likely than not, what it means is you got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get lucky a lot, but you'll assume that luck is skill. And three, four years down the road, it's going to hit you on the back of the head like, you, like a sledgehammer. And that's where things get really scary. So be careful. So what do you do with all this information? Well, you take it and you apply it into the eighth scale. So I'm just flipping through my pages here. Uh-huh. Public avalanche warning. Danger scale. Should be getting there soon. Or I'll just, there we are. So I showed this video when I did the uh, program on avalanche on the uh, ski touring, intro to ski touring, talking about how you choose the terrain. Basically, the national parks and the provincial parks have got a system in place where they've rated the terrain. And that way, you've got a sense of when is it safe to go to certain places based on the hazard. It's a really good system. And so you look up the bulletin, then you pull up the avalanche terrain exposure scale, and you can basically decide what areas are appropriate. Okay, so we have simple, challenging, complex terrain, and then hazard is low, moderate, considerable, high, or extreme. What do they recommend? Okay, in simple terrain, these are trips you could do um, when the hazard is low, moderate, considerable, and possibly when it's high. If you don't know the area and you're not comfortable with your experience with avalanches, this may not be a good idea. But if you've got some familiarity and you've got some background, you may consider, you know, going out when the hazard is high into simpler class one terrain. Challenging terrain, same thing, but it only works for low and moderate hazard. And then when the hazard gets to be considerable, it's sort of a maybe. And it's going to depend on your experience and your ability to identify avalanche hazard because there is avalanche terrain in these areas, but there is also safe terrain. And there are places to move through that will allow you to avoid the hazard and still complete your journey. Okay, when the hazard is high, you're kind of pushing your luck. 
and then complex terrain. These are areas where you have to go through the start zone or you're exposed to multiple slide paths or a combination of both and there are terrain traps. And so this gets pretty nasty. In simple, or sorry, in complex terrain when the hazard is low or moderate, this may be appropriate with extra caution if you understand what you need to be looking for. But you cannot eliminate your exposure to avalanche terrain in when you're in complex terrain just by the nature of it. You have to expose yourself. So this is a great tool. And if you do a search on the internet for ATES and then do Banff, and you'll come up to the page where Parks has their avalanche terrain exposure scale, you can download it as a PDF. Canonascus used to have one. They're currently upgrading it, so the old one is offline. If you look, you'll see my email address is on this uh, page, I think. You can see it throughout. Send me an email, and I will send you the old K-Country exposure scale. It's not perfect, but it's a good tool. And until the new one is out, you know, at least it'll help you sort of stay on the right track. So by all means, send me an email. I can also send you the trip planner, which allows you to put together going through all these stages to plan an appropriate trip. So that plus the emergency phone numbers, everything I offered last week, um, send me an email and I'll send it to you this week as well. And uh, it covers most of this. Then beyond this, you know, let's take a look. This is simple terrain, really nice gentle terrain. There's my son when he was six. This is McGill's shoulder. This is challenging terrain because there's lots of treat areas we can work with, but there's also some well-defined slide paths. We can avoid them or we can uh, embrace them. As you can see, there's tree, uh, tracks through here, but it'll depend on the hazard. And then there's complex terrain, such as going up Crowfoot Mountain, which actually involves having to go through some start zones, exposing yourself to larger slide paths, and um, moving through some terrain traps, so it's complex terrain. The avalanche bulletin says considerable, considerable, moderate. Would you go into simple terrain? Let's see. Yeah, go for it. It's perfectly reasonable. Okay, would you go into challenging terrain? No? Okay. The answer is maybe, depending on your comfort and your level of experience, because the areas that are about to appear in yellow, those are potential areas where you could see avalanche activity. But everything that's still in white remains, you know, for the most part, pretty safe under most conditions. So that's challenging terrain. Okay, but again, you wouldn't go into this area if the hazard was high. Then finally, complex terrain. Okay, this basically says no. And the reason for that is, as you go through it, you have to go through a canyon with slopes that can avalanche, classic terrain traps. There's steep convex rolls. This popped naturally. And this is at the bottom of a run we ski. So there's lots of concerns that you have to watch. You also have to ski up on a glacier on slope angles that could potentially slide. So you wouldn't go there if you have concerns about avalanche safety. Now for weather reports, you know what? Environment Canada does a really good job. And that's the one I usually use. There's also remote weather stations. And you can access them right off Avalanche Canada. See these? These are weather stations. So you can actually go into Kootenai Park and choose... What peak is this? Let's find out. Oh, there's two up here. I'll bet you this is Wimper. Nope, Simpson. So you can click on Simpson and you can see what the weather was doing one hour ago. So here we are at... Actually, it's uh, 6, 7, 8 p.m. Oh, that's even better. So at 8 p.m., there's 85 centimeters of snow. There's been 0.2 centimeters of snow in the last 24 hours. The temperature is minus 2.7. Now, the wind speed currently isn't available, but it can also give you the wind speed and other information. And that is real-time data. It is really nice. And this is for stations all through Western Canada. Just go to avalanche.ca. They've also got these blue pins, which is another great resource. Not so much weather, but you can click on them. And so on Wawa Ridge on Thursday, November 26th, so it's been a while ago, um, it was windy, cloudy, snow conditions were hard, wind affected, so it doesn't sound like great skiing. They skinned up the ridge, dug an extended column test, it broke uh, um, on 21 on Biden crust. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I think that's basically the November 5th crust, which was sort of the day that Biden got not was uh, voted in did not propagate. 
So you're getting information about tests. If you know about the tests, you know what they're talking about. And if you don't, you can check the bulletin, but you can see where they've been. You can get a sense of the ski conditions, the riding conditions, and if they had an avalanche incident, not necessarily a fatality or need for assistance, but if they popped a, a, an avalanche or they got one and they self-rescued and left, then they have a red dot on them. So that could give you really good information. Okay. Nobody's asking any questions. Wow. Okay, so this is just a wonderful resource from avalanche.ca. Then you go and you take the avalanche train exposure scale and you can figure out what are safe places to go. All right, so this is turning into a lot of the talk I did last week. So let's look at this one. This is a really wild situation. Oh, wrong avalanche, wrong avalanche. Let's take a look at avalanche systems and rescue. Okay, this introduction is about four minutes and it's worth watching. Ready? Do you have one? Hold it. Fuck. 
<laughs> yeah, I feel him. Just there. Just there. I can feel something. I'm trying to find his head. So that is a great video and it'd be very easy to sit down and criticize lots of things but you know what they never gave up he moved fast they did find the guy and they saved a life so good for them with that in mind we always want to make an effort to make sure that we have the basic skills so that we can make the rescue go as fast and as smoothly as possible but at the end of the day you don't ever want to do them it's like an airbag in your car you never want it to go off but I like having them in my car. So here's the avalanche fatalities in Canada. And you can see they're all over the map. What they really correlate to is the snowpack. If you have a good stable snowpack, you have relatively few deaths. And when you have the kind of snowpack that's got a lot of scary weak layers in it, you get a lot of deaths. And that's really what it comes down to. 02, 03, 08, 09, those were years when we had classic problems. And I don't know yet, but right now I'd say we have a couple of problems in our snowpack. And with the increased backcountry travel, we need to be a little more careful this year. In part because this is a snowpack that's not starting off in the best of conditions. And in part because there's going to be a lot of people out there. So learn the basic skills um, if you want to move in, into the backcountry and move around. You don't have to be an expert. But just take the time to get the information you need to make informed decisions. And by all means, there's lots of AST, Avalanche Skills Training courses being offered. Um, the ACC teaches them. I'm their principal instructor. The U of C is running programs. Yomneska is running program. Lots of private guides are running programs. They're all really good. Okay? We're all working to the same curriculum. So take the time. Get that information. There's three critical pieces of equipment you need to go into the backcountry transceiver, a probe, a shovel, and I would say wear a helmet. Trauma is a huge problem, especially in the Rockies, and one-third of all avalanche fatalities are trauma-related. If you take a blow to the head or the chest, that can kill you. Okay? You need to be protected. So, wasn't that comforting? There was a question here about the danger scales. I think Rick Checkland was asking. Uh, go back to the danger scale. What's the relationship between levels? I'm not going to get into that with too much detail. The, definitely you'll find that in most books and also when you take a course. But basically it, it's, it's a five point scale. Low being the most stable snowpack to extreme which is being the most dangerous. And considerable is that teeter-totter point where it can go either way. So that's in a nutshell what you're up against. So let's look at equipment because everybody likes equipment. Okay, so we're all told to carry transceivers good idea. If you're going to go in the backcountry, carry a transceiver, even if you don't necessarily think you're going into avalanche country, because you may be assisting someone else who is, or you may not be where you think you are. There was a case uh, not too long ago, probably maybe 10 years ago now, where two individuals passed away up in uh, Bristol Pass, and they were not carrying avalanche gear because they honestly didn't think they were going to expose themselves. As they were traveling, they came very close to a steep slow slope. It triggered remotely. They weren't on the slope. They were just below it. But their weight was enough to transmit through the snowpack and trigger a slab avalanche off a convex roll, and they were both buried. What's really tragic is there was another person behind them who was traveling alone who had a transceiver, a probe, and a shovel. And he was looking for them, and he was using his transceiver, but they didn't have any. And as a result, he couldn't find them. 
and he was so close to that event that there was a real chance he might have had a live save. So anytime you're in doubt, just rent them. You can get them uh, all sorts of places throughout Calgary. MEC, U of C, there's places in Canmore, there's places in Banff. But an avalanche transceiver is a way to be found. Okay? So it doesn't matter which beacon you buy. Frankly, I actually choose some of the beacons that are not considered professional use because I like really simple beacons. And those are my preference. Some of the really nice beacons that have got multiple search systems I find fairly complicated and in the stress of doing a rescue, I want something that's stupidly simple. So that's my preference. A lot of people prefer something that gives them more options. And a lot of guides train on different beacons. It doesn't matter. It's the beacon that works for you. They're all good. Okay, what would you say are the better avalanche safety books currently? Yeah. So Luther, um, I'm not the right person to ask because that line on the bottom of the uh, of the page is my avalanche book. I spent 10 years writing a book on avalanche safety. And in fact, what you're watching is all part of my book. It runs on a desktop or laptop computer. So um, I don't know of a bad one. Bruce Tremper's book is very good. Um, Bruce Jameson has got a basic book that's really good. Bruce was one of my mentors, and he's a professor who recently retired from the University of Calgary, spent 30, 40 years studying avalanche phenomena. Um, but as I said, I've also produced a book, and all this content is from my book. Okay. We won't go over a transceiver search. Pretty straightforward. We'll look at anomalies. Carry a probe. Because transceivers don't find people. They just get you really close. And if they get you close enough, you mark the spot and then you start probing. And then you'll find them easily within a minute. If you waste time trying to figure out within a tenth of a meter where the, next, where the person is buried, you're wasting time because the beacon's not that accurate. Just find the spot, mark it, get your probe out, drive it in the snow. Yes, you might hurt them. Don't keep poking when you get a strike, but when you can't push any farther, stop, dig it out. It's probably your victim. And we now recommend you have a probe that's at least three meters deep, because once upon a time, we um, used to say nobody survived beyond two meters. We've changed our standards, we're much better at digging, and now we're getting three meter burials out alive. The record in Canada is a four meter burial dug out alive by two people. That was just a couple years ago. So get a probe that's at least three meters long. Okay, shovels. Get a good, simple metal shovel with a solid handle. You don't have to buy the fancy, expensive ones. The only two shovels that have passed an old Swiss test was the Vole Telepro and the G3, I think it was called the Avitech, the little red shovel by G3. Those two shovels are the only ones that survived a shovel test by Manuel Genswein. Now, a lot of shovels have come on since, but no one's repeated this test, and to my knowledge, we don't have a standardized test for shovels. The funny thing is the Voli Telepro and the Avitech are the two cheapest shovels on the market, and they're the most reliable. I travel with a different shovel because I do a lot of digging and I've got something that's a little more adapted, but I tested one for two years to see if I could break it, and I carried an extra shovel with me in case it wasn't reliable. My wife and my son both have Voli Telepros. I have great confidence in that shovel, and as I said, G3s is just as well respected. So either one of those is great, and as I said, they're cheap. There is an issue with the Peeps transceiver. In fact, I have a Peeps right now. Um, by all means, contact Black Diamond because they now own Peeps. They've been pretty open and transparent about the issues, and if you have any concerns about the switch, you can take that transceiver back and have it recalled. They're very good about that. So yes, that's something to watch too. This is our new technique for shoveling. And the person describing it is Jordy Shepard, who's in charge of uh, with the Canadian Avalanche so uh, Association, teaching the search and rescue programs for professionals. And it's a bit different than the one you may have learned if you haven't taken a course in the last couple of years or if you've never taken a course. But this is now our current best practice for digging someone out of the snow. Uh, we're lining up in a straight line, downhill of the probe, putting the lead shoveler with their shoulder touching the probe, turn sideways to the slope, 
and then uh, the next person uh, down slope will be spaced out by an extended shovel handle. So you're moving snow from uh, your area of responsibility, uh, about a one meter cross section. You're trying to shovel down uh, as much as you can. Uh, initially you're shoveling down, everybody is in their area with moving the snow to the side. And once you get down about a shovel blade deep, then you're moving snow from your area of responsibility backwards uh, only as far as the next person and it becomes a uh, kind of a bucket brigade or a conveyor belt of snow. So we get a nice ramp effect that's coming down the probe. Uh, so the bulk of the shoveling down is happening near the front and as you get towards the back of your ramp um, it tapers into a nice uh, low grade angle uh, for, uh, ex for um, extricating your subject uh, once you get to them. You are going to get tired quite quickly. The first scenario is that you have about the right number of shovelers or, uh, or possibly not quite, en quite enough shovelers um, for the burial depth that you're dealing with and the slope that you're on. And so with, in that case, uh, you've lined up, you start shoveling. Uh, the first person or the second person can call the rotation. When a rotation is called, uh, you, you call rotate or switch. And now the first person is going to move out to the back of the, of the shoveling line. And the second person in line is going to move into the first position uh, and keep digging down the probe. Uh, and so you'll carry on with those rotations until you get additional shoveling resources hopefully showing up. The second strike team rotation method uh, is if you have an additional shoveler, uh, they can actually get a rest and become the shovel master and they'll rest for a rotation cycle. So the shovel master will stand there with a the shovel in hand. After two to three minutes, uh, they, will call a, they will call a switch, a rotation, and they will uh, move to the front position and everybody will move backwards. So the lead shoveler now moves back to position two. The last shoveler uh, will come, to the, come up and become the shovel master. And the shovel master has inserted themselves at the front of the, the shoveling line. The third rotation in strike team shoveling is uh, to, if you have additional shovelers besides your shovelers in a line and in addition to the shovel master, consider having a static shovel master who will only be directing operations. And now they will direct additional shovelers that are standing beside and resting. Uh, as soon as the, the lead shoveler starts slowing down, they will direct them into the front position and again, just like rotation number two uh, style, um, you will move everyone backwards one position and, uh, and now the back person uh, will spit out of the line and come stand in, in the line of additional shovelers. So for calculating the number of shovelers that is optimal, the, the basic math is if you're on a slope that's steeper than about 25 degrees, uh, you're going, you're, uh, the length of your snow conveyor corridor should be about equal to the burial depth. So in an example there, we've got a two meter deep burial with a probe strike now, uh, so, and we're on a greater than 25 degree slope uh, where the debris is. We're going to uh, need um, at least a two meter long snow conveyor corridor, and with each person covering about 80 centimeters to one meter of the, uh, of the snow conveyor corridor, if we divide that two meters by 80 centimeters, we come up with needing about two and a half shovelers to be optimal, or we would usually round up, so about three shovelers. Uh, the, other, um, the other scenario is you are on lower angle terrain, so less than 25 uh, degree debris. Uh, and in that case, the ramp uh, angle, uh, in order for it not to be too steep when you dig down, it needs to be longer. The snow conveyor corridor needs to be longer. And so the length of that corridor uh, would be two times the burial depth. We've got a two meter deep burial, we have a probe strike. Uh, now we determine uh, being on lower angle debris, less than 25 degrees, we are going to need a four meter long uh, snow conveyor corridor. And therefore dividing that by 80 centimeters, we end up with about five shovelers being optimal. Okay. So that's currently our best digging techniques, and it really is making a difference. We're getting recoveries so much faster, because remember, 12 minutes. 
someone's fully buried, you got to get them out in 12 minutes for a 50-50 chance. And so everything we can do to increase our digging speed is an advantage. Watch this, it's going to change over time. And by all means, share this out. If you want, if you're part of a group or you want to share this with friends, do a search in YouTube. I've posted that video. Jordy and I produced it because we wanted to get the word out to, to more of the public and the professionals. Frankly, a lot of professionals didn't know about these changes as well. <clears throat> Just uh, do a search on YouTube for conveyor shoveling. Uh, it's also on the BCA Backcountry Access website. And um, if you can't find it, just send me an email. You see my, uh, my address on the page there. And I'll be happy to send you the link because this is information everyone needs. We do have it out there. All right. Okay, so Adam asks a question of whether the AST1 is enough to assess easy terrain when first getting into the backcountry or should we always try, be trying to go out with someone more experienced? That's a really tough one. And I was there in the 1980s. And I was never quite sure. I, I, I fully know what you're struggling with there, Adam. I did a lot of trips with just one other person who had the same level of training as me. Um, you would try to find more experienced people, but you couldn't always do that. And so, again, using the Avalanche Train Exposure Scale is a really good way to start. If uh, you're in the Rockies or in the Columbias, Adam, I can certainly point you to some easy tours that you could probably get out to with some friends to build your skills and your comfort level. But um, I'm sorry, I don't have an easy answer. With the AST-1, you know enough that you can start getting out. And yes, if you're careful and you're traveling with friends and they have a basic level of knowledge as well, that's a good starting point and that's probably enough. If you're looking in and to get into big, aggressive lines, then as your skills start to improve or as your uncertainty grows because you want to do bigger stuff, you can look at an AST-2, which is the advanced course, or you can find more experienced people who you trust and learn from them. Um, but you're right, it, it's always a bit tricky. Ah, airbags! There's a question on airbags. Good, because that's where I was going next. Okay, airbag effectiveness. There's a lot of talk about airbags. Do they work? Don't they work? How well do they work? I remember seeing an ad in a magazine from a European company that said their airbags were 99% effective, which just blew me away because that was the answer. Turns out their stats were really skewed. The first and only independent test on avalanche airbags was conducted by Pascal Hagley, who's a, a researcher out of Simon Fraser University and currently leads most of the avalanche research in Canada. This is what Pascal had to say about airbags. Uh, recently, we were interested to better understand how effective avalanche airbags are. Uh, there's a bunch of different products out in the market, and uh, there's lots of people buying it. Uh, but it, we were really interested in knowing how effective they actually are preventing fatalities once you're involved in an avalanche. Now, this is not a trivial question. Um, and so it took a little bit of thinking of how to actually get at that statistic. There were quite a number of, uh, sort of statistics out there, but they were primarily promoted by the companies selling these products. So we wanted sort of an independent, uh, objective perspective on it. So I teamed up with uh, a bunch of avalanche uh, warning services in Europe and North America to gather as much information on avalanche accidents that involved avalanche airbags. And then we focused our attention on accidents that included both users and non-users of avalanche airbags. This would allow us to sort of um, isolate the effect of airbags because we had victims that were in the same avalanche both with and without. And when we studied those cases, we found out that people without airbags had a survival rate in these accidents of 78%. So basically, two out of 10 people died in these avalanches. In those same avalanches, people with airbags had a survival rate of 89%. So in this case, one out of 10 person died when they had an inflated avalanche airbag. So it basically reduced the fatality rate by half. Um, so that's a very significant effect. Unfortunately, we also found out 
that in about 20% of the cases where, um, where people had avalanche airbags, they didn't inflate them when they were involved. So for some reason, they didn't have time to deploy them. They didn't think about deploying them in that really critical moment. And therefore, the avalanche airbag didn't have a positive effect on them. So in fact, sort of the effect is actually slightly smaller. So the sort of take home messages from our results are avalanche airbags are a very useful additional avalanche safety equipment. They do not replace a beacon, shovel, and probe, uh, but they can really help you increase your chance of surviving an avalanche involvement. They're not a silver bullet. People still die, even with fully inflated airbags. So people get deeply buried when they're getting pushed into terrain traps. Avalanche airbags are not very effective when um, you're getting strained through trees and you sustain fatal injuries. Um, or they're also not very effective when you get hit from an avalanche from above. You really have to be involved in the avalanche. If you buy an avalanche airbag, practice the deployment. Just to make sure that in that critical moment when you need to rely on that safety equipment that you actually uh, sort of almost like intuitively deploy the airbag. So there's Pascal giving us the uh, background on avalanche airbags. So depending on how you play the stats, they reduce fatalities by half or they increase the survival rate by 12%, depending on which way you look at it. They do work. They work well. They are not a silver bullet. There is no statistical evidence that they reduce the risk of trauma, so you have just a higher risk of dying or suffering severe injury uh, by hitting rocks and trees on the way down. They are not an effective barrier. Uh, at least there's no evidence to support that yet. Um, they also have some other limitations. You need to be moving with the debris. So if you're in a situation where you're standing on the flats and the avalanche is coming towards you, the airbag is not particularly effective until you gain momentum with the avalanche. Then you become a particle and you're sorted and move towards the surface. Everyone asks me, do I have an airbag? I do not. And it's not because I don't like them or I don't want to use them. It's simply because as a guide, I have to carry extra gear. They do not make a pack big enough for me to carry the gear I'm required to by industry standards that is an avalanche airbag pack. So that is why I don't carry one. If I went back to skiing a mechanized industry with a cat skiing or heli skiing, I can carry a lot less gear and then I would use an airbag. But at this time, there is not a pack big enough to meet my needs and that's why I don't. Um, otherwise, yes, I would certainly seriously consider it because I'm in that terrain fairly regularly. Okay, so that's a really quick synopsis of some of the basics. However, you know what? This is not the bottom line. As you can see, there's a lot to go over here. This is my, my ebook, and it's 220 pages with over 80 videos um, looking at avalanche safety. The, a lot of the stuff I sent you, uh, the PDFs with the cards and the tools, they're all links down here that you can access. But probably the most important thing to keep in mind is that 80% of all avalanche fatalities right now, today, are the result of human error. And it's not, we didn't know, or this was some one and I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, you know, this was unforeseen. We're very experienced. It just came out of nowhere. We couldn't have possibly seen it. That's usually a pretty good clue to indicate they missed something and they missed something big. We know most of the conditions required for an avalanche. We know what the terrain looks like. Nine out of ten times, if you'd really stopped and just thought your way through, you would have known. It's human error and our humans, as humans, we make mistakes and we have to accept that. Which means that if someone is leading a group or you're relying on someone who you feel is much more experienced, your best tool and defense is to ask questions. We should constantly be challenging each other 
Doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an expert. If you're a beginner, well, that's great because you can learn more. If you call yourself an expert, be careful because some of the most respected people in the industry, and they were my teachers and mentors, I was very fortunate earlier on, they never called themselves experts because they knew enough to know they never knew 100% of what they had to to make the right decision. And so they would hedge their bets or they would be a little more careful. And that is the reality. We are really good at being right most of the time. We're never right all the time. And then there's other factors that get in the way. We can be tired, we can be rushed, we can have other issues going on, and we can just short circuit the process of making a good decision because something else is driving us. And I'd like to show you this as an example. And this is the best and the brightest in the world. Two, one, and lift off. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. This was not an accident. Well, I don't think we should, be keep, we should call the Challenger event an accident. It was the result of human error, and they were told this would happen. The engineer who designed the seals on the solid rocket booster, which failed and caused the explosion, he knew that was going to happen. He told his superiors that the seal will fail in those cold temperatures because it was a cold day when they were going to launch. And they told NASA the seals could fail. And for some strange reason, after a few hours on the phone, the company and NASA decided to launch anyways. And that night, the engineer who brought his alarm told his wife, if they launch in the morning, the shuttle will explode. That is the best and the brightest. People do stupid things, and we can't always figure out why. And so my advice to you is it doesn't matter who you're traveling with, the best thing you can do is to question them, ask them why. Because what you will find is if people are working based on sound knowledge, they can answer your questions and they can get into detail. And when you ask other questions, they can answer that because they're familiar with the background and the tangents. If you ask questions and you get shut down or the answers aren't very, conci aren't very uh, concise or you feel like you're being ignored or belittled, you're in trouble. And nothing may happen that day but you're in trouble. And the only times I've gotten into real trouble at work was when basically people weren't listening to each other. So stop, sit back and figure it out. One of the biggest threats, uh, behavioral psychologist to win a Nobel laureate, um, basically said probably the biggest threat to all of us and the biggest cause of most accidents is overconfidence or the illusion of knowledge, okay? You look at these two lines. We all know this illusion. They're the same line. That doesn't change the fact that we still see one as longer than the other. You see, this is the limitations of our brain. Even though we've learned something, we cannot rewire our brain to see it differently. And so if we're not paying close attention to that, we're going to assume the bottom line is shorter. We can't help it. Um, Frankly, I think this is a great example of why evolution does work. Because when you look at the way our brains evolved, <laughs> it's amazing we're as smart as we are, because they're really just lumps stacked one on top of the other that are connected by neurons. It was not a well thought out process. You know? So take your time, think this through. And I'm just trying to get to a page here. Because would you trust this guy in the backcountry? Because you've been listening to him for the last hour and a half. 
never be afraid to question or challenge. And if you're not comfortable with something, back off. If you're traveling with friends, they will respect your opinion. If you're traveling with a guide or with a leader, they should be willing to listen to what you have to say and respect your decisions or your concerns. Whenever I travel in the backcountry, it's by consensus. Anybody could pull the plug. When my son was six and we traveled in the mountains, he could pull the plug if he thought the avalanche hazard was too high. It didn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's wrong. He's not having fun. Just slow it down, think it through, and everyone makes decisions by consensus. Get the information so that you've got the bulletin, you've got the weather, choose appropriate terrains, and when you're making decisions that have consequences, talk them over with your group. Take the time to gather the information. If you're comfortable with your decision, then you know you can travel in a safe manner, one at a time usually, um, or you can back off. You can always come back later. And this is just the beginning of avalanche safety. It never ends. One of the things I did to learn more about this is I wrote this book. And I spent 10 years gathering the information and researching it so that I could put this together. Um, I'd had all my tickets to work in the industry, but I knew I still had a lot to learn. So don't ever stop learning. Take your time, ask questions, and sometimes even divergent subjects like behavioral psychology can become pretty valuable. Okay, so uh, let's see. As to the questions, uh, I wonder if statistics also take into account people with airbags. So uh, there's a question here about airbags uh, from, I'm sorry, I'll probably mispronounce the name, but I think it's uh, Ildar or uh, Ladar. Uh, I wonder if the statistics of avalanche fatalities takes into account that people with airbags are willing to go into more severe terrain, so the effect may be a little bit better. This is actually a, a known uh, phenomena and it's called risk homeostasis. And uh, I talked to Pascal about it, and I did some research in it. And he was actually in the process of doing research while I was writing this book. And I want to update the book, because what his research suggests is, yes, people who have airbags tend to behave a bit riskier, so they take more chances. But what he also found is having the airbag more than compensated for that increased level of risk. So... Don't let the airbag get you into places you wouldn't go otherwise. But the airbag was still more of an asset than a liability because it is conceivable people would start doing things that are far more dangerous thinking they're much safer. And uh, a great industry that saw this was um, uh, sport jumping. Um, when you jump up with a parachute, I can't remember what that's called. But anyways, as they improved the equipment, people became more risk tolerant. And they found, despite having safer equipment, they were still having the exact same number of fatalities per capita. And so that was where risk homeostasis started getting its, its first uh, serious exploration. Vehicles are kind of the same. As we build cars safer, people drive more aggressively. But some of the devices are well hidden, so we don't know about them, like airbags and anti-lock brakes. And they did make a difference in the long term, although anti-lock brakes initially led to an increase in accidents because everyone expected more from them than what they could do. Go figure. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, very light over the valley. Okay. Will this talk be available to view later? I believe it is. Um, I believe this link, uh, once it's saved, you can come back and check it another time. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, my best advice really is, is it's the human factors. Go with people you trust. People who make you feel comfortable and who will listen to what you have to say. Because if the group sits down, sits down and talks it over, chances are you're going to be okay. It's when you get pushed or rushed into something. And uh, it's true. We do have limited vision. I don't have time to show you, but uh, one of the re I did a lot of work on human behavior because this was so new to me. And I spent three years reading books and talking to people. And uh, if you really want a good, good experiment... Where is it in here? I've got this link. Go and check out uh, this link. It's, um, yeah, call, it's from a book called The Invisible Gorilla. Look that up if you want to. They've got some really interesting videos, and uh, I guarantee you that uh, you're going to get caught off guard. Maybe not where you think, though. Okay, so, yeah, we make mistakes, and our brain isn't well designed for really complex decisions, so we got to slow down and take our time. Okay, 
So has this been useful? Do you guys have any questions? I've run a bit longer. I'll shut her down soon. But I'm happy to stay here for as long as um, people have questions. And if you do want some, uh, some of the information on the uh, rescue cards and the avalanche train exposure scale, like I said, just send me an email and I'm happy to send you those uh, via WeTransfer. Nothing yet, so let's see. Okay, well, while I'm waiting, let me show you some video. This one I really like because it's... Okay, this is my family. That was our son when he was six. Oh, he was seven, sorry. <laughs> we took him up on the Wapta when he was 12, got him to the Bohut when he was 11. But it wasn't until he was 12 that he was old enough that we could actually get uh, backcountry skis on him. There he is at 14, and uh, we skied a section of the Spray Range Traverse. So I was taking my family into avalanche terrain. And I think that's only fair, because if I'm going to lead other people in, I need to be comfortable taking my own family in. But my standard of care is this. Anybody I take in the backcountry is that kid on the right. If I won't take my son there, there's no way I'm taking anybody else there because we're all somebody's child or we're somebody's parent. So I think that served me really well. It hasn't stopped me from going into some big places, but it has changed the way I approach them. Okay, oh, sorry, I missed a question here earlier. Um, Art asks, um, if uh, the probe is impeding digging, is it okay to remove it? I think that's going to depend on your situation, Art. If you're comfortable, you know exactly where the person is and you know their depth, sure, you can remove the probe. But if there is any doubt as to whether or not you're going to, you know, miss the person or have issues finding them because they're buried quite deep, I would keep the probe in place because you don't want to waste time. Um, so it's a bit of a, you know, it depends answer, which I know is not what you're looking for, but... If you're comfortable, you've got them, and they're close, sure, remove the probe. If you're not, it's a ways to go and, you know, the probe isn't a major impediment, I would definitely keep it in place. I wouldn't think about removing the probe unless I knew I had the person. Just because once you pull it out, you may have to dig around to find them again. But again, you know what, if it's really impacting your ability to dig, then you have to make that call. Learning to ski. Are there any newer snowpack tests that have been have shown good potential? Yes, this is my favorite. I'll show it to you right now. It's called the Extended Column Test. It's not that new. It's about a decade or so old now. Um, avalanche, here we are, field ops. Oh, sorry, snow tests. And the avalanche, the, uh, the ECT test, so that's the compression test. Yeah, we did that. But uh, let me show you this one. This is a great test because it does two things. It looks both at the potential to initiate um, a weak layer, but also whether or not the snow plaque propagates. Okay, uh, there we are. I can't remember if I have audio or not. I don't think so, but I'll turn it on. Okay, so what you do is you isolate a column of snow, and it's like a compression test, except this time, instead of doing a 30 by 30 meter square about your shovel blade, it's 30 by 90. And you don't have to dig out this much snow, but I wanted it to be visible. And then you can dig out the back side where I'm putting the probe in as well, and you can have one person on each side cutting with a cord. Or, if you've got big gorilla arms like I do, you can just reach across and you can cut as an individual. It only takes a minute or two more than a, a, a compression test to make. But what it does is it only identifies weak layers that will propagate. So as you're tapping it, okay, so that's at the wrist, that's at the easy level. Then I come from the elbow. And watch what happens. See, that weak layer propagated across the entire weak base of the snowpack. So that gives us an idea not just of whether a weak layer can be initiated, but whether that weak layer can propagate. It is not the definitive test. But it does provide some really good information. Okay, 
And the reason I say that is I'll show you something a little earlier. Sorry, got to get my mouse across. And this is quite freaky. This is a research project that was done by Cam McClellan, Cam Campbell, sorry, by Cam Campbell, and he was working on his master's thesis. And these are Roosh block tests where a skier jumps on a block of snow and we score the failure. If it fails on a one, that's when you cut the block. A two is when the skier steps on it. A three is with a knee jerk. A four is a jump. A five is a second jump. A six is when you step to the middle of the block and you jump on it. And a seven is no failure. Look at the variability in here. Just as the person starts to step on it, it fails. Just over here, no failure whatsoever. And in between, it fails on the first jump. Here, it failed as you see the individual steps on it. This one, it took two big jumps. And over here, there was no failure. This is called spatial variability. And this is where chaos theory comes in. And I find that fascinating. But basically, there is a lot of variability in the snowpack. And so when you look at this, you think we're all doomed. We're not. When you add up the numbers, when you run all these numbers through here, 2 to 5 accounts for 87% of all the tests. So 87% of the time, it indicates a potential weak layer that could be human triggered. 13% of the time, it said the slope was stable. Okay, what that means is you cannot trust one or two tests. You need to do multiple tests as you move through the landscape. And then you have to look for patterns. Are these patterns considered? Are these patterns consistent? How much variability is there in your tests and your patterns? And then take this information and compare it to the bulletin, compare it to your field observations, and compare it to the landscape you're going into. It's a lot to process, but when you do that, then these become fairly useful tools. On their own, they should not be used to decide whether a slope is stable or dangerous. But in conjunction with the other resources, it does give you information. And as I said, the ECT was produced after this uh, paper was done. But it's not the answer, but it does tend to give us better information in general. Okay. Okay, so... Okay, oh. Okay, thanks so much. I've taken a number of courses and you have enjoyed this. Okay. Are there newer snow tests or need to ski? Yeah, no, beyond the more widespread acceptance of the ECT. Sorry, no, past the ECT, we don't have too much new. Uh, the progressive saw test came out at the same time. By all means, look it up online if you're curious about it. There's some good papers. The problem with the progressive saw test is that it has to be done very carefully because it's very easy to make an error, and if you do, it won't give you accurate information. The nice thing about the progressive saw test, it is one of the very few tests that can be used for deep, persistent, weak layers. So weak layers that are deeper than a meter or a meter and a half, the progressive saw test may still be valid for. Um, but beyond that, no. What we're really focusing a lot of our energies on is human factors, because that is where we see the greatest potential for reducing accidents. Okay. Um, so sorry, I didn't see that post until later. Learn to ski. Pauline, um, thanks. Is my ebook focused on conditions? My ebook is very generalized. Uh, most of the footage and the events are in the Rockies, but it is basically based on the on the same material and phenomena that you'd find just about anywhere in the world. I don't discuss some of the really weird things that happen in places like Iceland. But um, even in Iceland, most of the time, things are kind of consistent. But they do have some, some events that are a bit weird. So I hope that helps. Oh, it's 9 o'clock. Thanks, everyone. If there's uh, more questions, I'll sit here for another minute or two. Otherwise, I, uh, I'm going to go have some dinner in a minute. So thank you very much. Hmm. Okay, so just because I like it. Oh, wait a second, wrong one. While I wait to see if there's more questions. Um, this is kind of fun. This is going up uh, Cathedral Mountain. Complex terrain. 
pretty serious, but very cool. Then, I just really like this page. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. This is just looking out uh, the front door of our house. These are some birch trees our neighbors have uh, planted, and we actually live in town. It just doesn't look like it. Oops, sorry. And these are snowflakes that landed on our barbecue. Um, it was a black ba background, so I took it off with Photoshop, but I was able to get some really nice tight shots, and I just like crystals. It's very cool. That's a snowflake with frost on it. It's called rhymed. That's what happens when a rhymed crystal just grows to the point where you can't see it anymore. We call it grapple. It's kind of like tiny hail, but it's a single pellet. I won't get into that. These are electron micrograph images. Very nice. These are rounds. Snowmelt. You've all seen snowmelt. This is pinwheeling due to daytime heating. This is water runnels going through the snow when it rains on you. Probably see that a lot in the coast. This is a big, beautiful piece of depth hoar. Depth hoar is like facets. They're evil, they're bad, they weaken the snowpack. And they're dangerous, they also last a long time, but they're really beautiful. These are facets. They're kind of, this when you punch through this crust on the snow and you reach down and you pour sugar. You won't see that on the coast, but you'll find it a lot in the Rockies. And about once out of every three years, you might see it in the interior around Revelstoke, uh, Golden Area. And uh, it really is sugar snow. They're like little facets, hence the name, facets. This is what they look like on an electron micrograph. And these are some bigger facets that are just starting to build steps, so we call those striations. Doesn't matter. Bad is bad. This is what happens when the snowpack is shallow and the temperatures get cold. We start getting facets. And they behave, Bruce calls it, uh, Bruce calls it gravel. Or, yeah, Bruce calls it gravel. I call them ball bearings, just because it's a little more descriptive. Okay. So thanks, guys. Hopefully we'll uh, see you next week. Crevasse Rescue is kind of cool because there's a lot of new stuff there. Um, we've really been changing the standards for, for Crevasse Rescue. So take care, folks, and thank you very much. Have a good evening.